here. Well, kia ora, good morning everyone. Can I just say thank you for coming out to our State of the Nation speech. Uh, as you could see, uh, it was a scene setter. It was really about communicating to the New Zealand people the reality of where we start, uh, that we are going to be a government that is going to face some tough choices, but we are a government of action. And we're actually here to make sure that every quarter we're getting things done for the New Zealand people. And we should also have hope that we can actually get ourselves to a better place, that actually as tough as things are right now, as difficult as things are across the economy, across society and across the environment, we've got a lot of work ahead of us to do. And so as a government, we're very determined to do so. With that, happy to take questions. $200 billion fiscal gap in transport, where's that figure come from? Yeah, I mean, again, it's classic Labour. Uh, what we saw was a huge announcement for Second Harbour crossings, Auckland Light Rail, Wellington, let's get Wellington moving. And again, big announcements and no budget actually put aside to actually deal with those projects, and that's where that comes from. So was it from the Ministry of Transport Union? Yes, it was. Yes. Yes. Like last year, why are you only raising it now? Oh, well, we have been working our way through a number of fiscal cliffs under funded projects projects, uh, cost overruns. Uh, Nicola's done an exceptionally uh, good job with Treasury trying to identify actually the state of the books. You know, one of the things I also alluded to in that speech was that actually the government was not going to be funding Pharmac uh, after the point, at some point at the end of this year. So again, what we've seen, yeah, but again, you know, unacceptable really. You don't have a four-year budget process and actually decide you're just going to have time-limited funding, which we've seen across the whole of the, uh, across the government. So again, a lot of financial chicanery, uh, but actually we need to be get clear on where that all sits and then actually how we move that forward. So have you well, again, you've seen us go through. Um, we need, we've, we've, you know, Simeon's already you know, called for uh, an understanding of what we need to do around the Second Harbour Crossing uh, to get that right size and appropriate. Uh, we've already cancelled uh, Auckland Light Rail because we spent $200 million doing nothing for the last six years. Cancel Wellington, let's get Wellington moving. We are very committed. All of them, though, on the consumers, be cancelled all of the projects that make up that? Oh, a good, good proportion of them. But again, things like the Second Harbour Crossing, we're very invested in. And we know we need to spend money on that. Again, the way we may go about doing that, how we fund it, how we finance it, all of that we'll look into in the coming months. So um, oh, um, um, Simeon, do you want to talk to that? Or we can give you that. But, but it's pretty clear what we've cancelled. Yeah, well, the reality is we've, we've been very clear around some of those projects that we've cancelled. Let's get Wellington moving, Auckland Light Rail, uh, IREX. Uh, the, well, hundreds of millions of dollars. But the reality is if we didn't make those decisions, there would be billions and billions of dollars being spent on projects which are going nowhere and wouldn't deliver the results that New Zealanders need. So we're going through with a fine tooth comb on all of those projects so that we have every dollar focused on what New Zealanders need rather than the waste of the last government. If you've yeah. that figure like last year, why are you sharing it now? Can I just note that it was actually referred to mm. in my mini budget. It was That's in right. some of those press releases but wasn't picked up at the time. Um, so we're bringing new emphasis to it today. Yeah. Correct. Simon. Uh, your Minister of Transport announced that one of the priorities in transport is to be a new four lane road to the road. Yes, excellent. Uh, well, that's actually something we're working through right now about how we do the funding and the financing in general. As you well know, we talked about before the election that we actually have a massive infrastructure deficit in this country that's built up under successive governments. We are going to look at different ways of funding and financing uh, in terms of public money, private money, how we actually make that come together and work. Both Chris and Simeon are working on that. We'll have more to say about that shortly. The Minister has also announced <coughs> the wrong program the Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, again, we're working our way through that as we, we had a plan before the election. We're getting very clear about what the state of the books are in, in New Zealand right now, and both uh, Simeon and Chris are working through funding options going forward. The reason I ask is that isn't it normal for governments to announce wrong decisions <laughs> on the transport projects without funding? Well, I'd certainly say to you, Simon, it wasn't normal over the last six years. What we saw was a hell of a lot of press releases and actually no money followed up and actually backing up any of those projects. We're getting clear about the state of the books, which, as I said, there have been things that have been announced, from Pharmac drugs right through to transport projects, uh, where things are announced but actually not delivered and not funded and money not put aside. We'll work our way through that. Um, we'll, we'll do that as part of our budget experience uh, in May, but also, as I say, have said to you and said before the election, we are very open and wanting to wrap rapidly explore different funding and financing tools so that we can get that going. In the intervening period between now and when we get to the funding and financing piece of it, we are working incredibly hard on resource consenting. We are going to fast track a lot of stuff in this country because we need to get things done. We do. We do. 
Well, again, what, what, what's unacceptable is that in government you actually stand up and tell the New Zealand people that actually we're doing this project and you haven't got a source of funding for it. That's what we're working through right now. Simeon's going right through our transport uh, you know, positioning statement and making sure that we've got our funding in place. Uh, he's working through and having to face up to a lot of holes that have been left in fiscal cliffs and unfunded projects and cost overruns. We'll get that square and straight and rest assured when we announce stuff, we'll have funding for it. Do you um, again, what we're saying there is that we will always have a social security system in New Zealand that supports New Zealanders in need. But when you're on an unemployment benefit, as I've said many times before, that these are New Zealanders that are deemed and capable of working. That's why they are assessed to be on an unemployment benefit. We want to support them in that transition as they go between jobs or trying to secure a job. But what we're not going to do is let people languish on welfare for 24 years. That's not kindness. It's not compassion. We care about those young people. We love those young people. We want to get them off welfare and into work. And so that mentality has to stop. We have to be able to say, look, you know, you have a right where fellow Kiwi taxpayers are actually supporting you in a time of need, and we feel all really good about that, and we're really proud about that in New Zealand. But equally, there's a responsibility that you actually do need to make sure you're holding your obligations up. That, that, that's the deal. That's the deal. So the question is, if you're not doing that, I'm sorry, we will sanction benefits. We will do stuff. Sure. Why did you go so strongly after Well, what we're, what we're frustrated about is we've had a government in the last six years with record levels of job vacancies in many sectors, low levels of unemployment. It's added 70,000 more people into unemployment benefit. People who are on unemployment, as I said, are actually, that's where our focus is, are actually people who are able, are deemed capable of working. Now, we have to invest in them to make sure that they are work ready. That's why you've seen our program like Welfare That Works, that we want to get onto that uh, in the next quarter or so, uh, which is about taking young people in particular, making sure they've got a jobs coach, they're set up for success and they actually stick in a job for 12 months. That's a big focus of ours. But if you're on unemployment, not forget about the other benefits, you know, that is a, a classic case where you are deemed capable and able to be working. We want those young people, we want those people in work. It is so much better for them than being sitting on welfare for a long time. Um, well, it's talking about our government and what our government actions have been. As I said, we've had a huge amount of focus on the 49 actions to deliver in 100 days. Those are agreements that we have done uh, as, a, as, a, as a coalition government. Uh, when we finish the 100 days, we're going to roll into a quarter two set of activities and plans as well, uh, and there'll be a combination of, um, of what we've agreed um, between our three parties. It's a three-party government though, right? And you, and you were talking about the tough choices that the government's going to have to make. You can't make mm. those decisions without the two other parties. Why not mention them? Well, we've already discussed a lot of those things, that we've got massive alignment on many of those issues. And so, you know, that's why we spent time in our negotiations that we went about it very differently from how it had happened in previous years. We went through every line item of every manifesto of all three parties. We came to an agreement. We came to um, a, a program of work that we actually are all very committed in in the next three years. Why not mention your coalition Well, we're working really effectively together. I mean, together um, we've got ACT ministers, we've got New Zealand First Ministers, we've got National Party Ministers. That cabinet is functioning and working well. We're actually driving towards getting things done. We have got huge amounts of alignment. Well, I meant our, meant our, I referenced our government many times. Just yeah. on the um, you called it a free ride. Do you really think that the benefits are a free ride? No, that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is if you have not holding your obligations up to look for work, to train for work, to be prepared for work, 100% of your job when you're on unemployment benefit is getting off an unemployment so benefit. Well, we've talked a lot about the fact that we want to make sure that we've got the sanctions in place uh, that are already being, uh, they're already in law today, that they're being upheld and make sure that they've been delivered. We want to make sure we want to make sure that actually anyone who's not holding their obligations, not showing up for job interviews, not doing what they need to do to get themselves work ready, that actually those are things where we will have a traffic light system as we navigate through it. And most importantly, we want to do a, a more powerful intervention on under 25s. We have a ridiculous situation. 55% of our kids are not in school regularly. Now we've seen a massive growth in under 25 sitting on welfare. That we are not writing off that generation. I'm sorry, we will do whatever the hell it takes to actually make sure we get those young people prepared and connected to work. You're not worried that in the process the changes that you're making to welfare that could push thousands of children further into poverty? Uh, what I'm focused on is making sure that everyone's entitled to welfare holds their obligations and their responsibilities. New Zealand society is predicated on a very simple construct. We have rights as Kiwis to, you know, that we, we expect from each other and from the country, but we also have responsibilities. For those that are not holding up their responsibilities, that's very clear. We're going to make sure that happens. But for many people on, on welfare, they are meeting their obligations. And they, as long 
long as an individual... Sure, sure, but an individual has to make a choice to say they're holding and delivering on their obligations, and that's all we're asking them to do. And many are, let's be clear, and I've said that before, and you and I have spoken about it when we've talked about our welfare policies in the past. Um, we need to make sure that the vast majority of New Zealanders are doing that. But for those that aren't, I'm sorry, we'll have sanctions. How many do you think aren't doing that? How many of the 70,000 um, we just want to make sure that everyone's holding up their obligations. There are lots of um, reports of people who aren't showing up for multiple interviews, that have cancelled them, all those sorts of things. We've got to make sure that that's all being managed. Again, I'm not getting into that. I'm just saying to you there's 70,000 more on welfare. That shouldn't be happening at a time of low unemployment and record job vacancies. All of the things that you've done so far is overwhelmingly dominated by those that you're appealing on behalf. Yes. Is that what this term is going to be about? No. What are you going to be about undoing rather than... Well, we just, we have a huge amount of dumb projects that the previous government put in place that have been wasted huge amounts of money and delivered nothing. Mm -hmm. So I make no apologies. We are doing what we said we would do. Mm -hmm. We have for two years said we're going to knock off three waters reforms because they're dumb and stupid and expensive. And so we've done that. We've implemented our policy we announced last year and we've done exactly that. We said that the RMA and actually, you know, you know, stultifying this country so it can't do stuff uh, is unacceptable. We killed the RMA before Christmas. We're now going to beef up big time the fast-tracking consenting. So we make no apologies for doing what we campaigned on. We are doing exactly what I told the New Zealand people we would do. The first 100 days is about making sure we stop the dumb stuff that's not adding any value and is adding huge amounts of cost. But you've also seen us already say, for this year, yes, we're going to whack in the security personnel to make sure our hospital and the emergency department is safe. Yes, we're going to make sure we've got a mobile phone ban in place. It's already getting positive reaction from parents and principals already just a couple of weeks into the school year. We're already said and jammed in an hour of mass reading and writing. No, no, but you asked me the question, so I'm just saying to you, I'm giving you context, that yes, there's stuff that we're going to kill because it's, because it's dumb and stupid from the previous government, and we make no apologies for that, and we campaigned on it, and we're going to do what we say we're going to do. We are not a government that manages by PR and spin and doesn't do follow through and get things done. End, end of story. Why didn't you announce anything new into that space? Because we don't need to, because we have 49 actions in our first 100 days. You are well aware of what they are. Every week we're out there after post-cabinet announcing new things through the course of any given week. You saw last week we announced we we're repealing three waters. Uh, again, we do not run like the previous government. It was all PR, managed by PR, and no follow-through and no action and no delivery. Wasteful spending, no delivery. That's not our mode. Just on one of those line items which we mentioned earlier with coalition partners, um, six education changes to schools. When will the teachers in schools... Yeah, I saw Chris Hipkins bang on about that this morning, and I just thought, how embarrassing, absolutely embarrassing. We want sex education and good sex education across New Zealand schools. It ain't going anywhere. All we've asked for is to make sure that the curriculum is age-appropriate and parents get consulted on. The sad thing is Chris, Chris Hipkins, his former education minister, should have been talking about why he hasn't done a job of getting our kids into school or teaching them the basics. So I thought it was pretty embarrassing, again, from the Labor Party, focused on the wrong things. Because they've been called scary, frightening and dangerous, the changes. Are they that? Well, again, the challenge challenge here is that we've been in between a curriculum and all we're asking for is we will always have sex education in New Zealand schools. It's so critical, so important. Uh, parents have a responsibility and a role to play in that as well. But importantly, we need to make sure that it's age appropriate and we also need to make sure parents are being consulted. That's all we're asking for. That process can be moved through. Um, but I'd just say to Chris Hipkins and, and the Labor team, again, barking at the wrong car, uh, to be honest. So, There'll be, uh, uh, we, we'll, let, we'll let experts get into the detail of it, but we've just got to make sure it's... Well, yeah, of course, but I mean, we, there's a whole range of issues we want to make sure that's covered in our sex education curriculum, you know, and the bottom line is that um, we will make sure that we've got uh, age appropriate, and most importantly, the frustration has been that parents haven't been consulted, and the third thing that's been frustrating is the variability of the teaching on the curriculum, because it hasn't been specified and locked as a, as a lockdown curriculum, each school, each teacher's interpreted it slightly different, so the inconsistency of our kids and the quality of education they're getting around sex education is, is variable. Well, there'll be a role for that. Um, but again, what we're asking for is age appropriate and for parents to be consulted. The, the, the wording is the removal and replacement of gender, sexuality, and relationship based education guidelines. Is, is that what, what's happening? There Look, I just would put it to you if you seriously think the Labour Party are on to a winner here as a topic of discussion in this country, that's right, that's at a time, at a time, at a time when we have 55% of our kids. Correct. Correct. And so what the intention is, is to make sure that we've got age appropriate curriculum, we've got parents consulted, and we've got a consistency of teaching across the country. What age is appropriate? 
appropriate Again, that will be issues for a panel and an expert bu a bunch of panel to, to put together. Right. But, I'm, but I'm confident we can, we are rest assured, we're going to have sex education in New Zealand. It's very important. Parents have a role to play. Schools have a role to play. We need to make sure that it's age appropriate. Parents are consulted and there's a consistency in the teaching. Right. You, feel, you feel good taking this message and you're the gay out later on today. You feel good taking this message? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I went there last year. I loved it. I'm looking forward to going there again this afternoon. Um, again, uh, but talk to the rainbow community and I just say to you, what are they fixated on at the moment? Rebuilding the economy, restoring law and order, delivering better health and education. Oh, I disagree. Uh, the Mayor and I have actually got a good relationship and we've talked about what we want to work together on and we're actually pretty aligned around that. Yes, we're going to knock off the... We're, not, we're knocking off the Auckland Regional Fuel Tax, a program and, and something that we oppose from its very incarnation. And so we uh, make no apologies about knocking that on the head. 11.5 cents per litre, an extra almost $10 uh, for a fill in a, big, you know, in a bigger car. It's $5 in a Toyota Corolla. I'm sorry, in a cost of living crisis that stops. But the conversation we're having with the Mayor and the Council is right. How do we get congestion charging and, and time and use um, charging into place? Those are things we'll work together on. Remember, with respect to the, the transport projects, there's 340 million dollars of that 680 million that's actually uh, been sitting in a bank account that is actually going to be two years of programs that we're going to continue to work out on big projects like the Eastern Busway, like electrifying the CRL and like doing some road corridors. So I think we will have a very good aligned program uh, with the Mayor and the Council. We want to work together on supercharging Auckland and making sure it can handle the growth well. Well, we won't expect them to be doing that. Uh, we're, well, we'll be, we'll be watching it very closely, and, and we do have those things in place. But what I'm saying to you is 11.5 cents per litre is coming off. And that's why, because it's a regressive tax. If you happen to be a lower-income uh, person in, in Auckland and you've got a less fuel-efficient car, you're paying a higher proportion than you should be. And more importantly, um, that money, as I said, we've got $340 million, I think it is, just sitting in a bank account. It's over two years' worth of uh, transport project activity. We, we've agreed with the Mayor the projects that we want to put that money to over the next two years and in the intervening period we'll set up a different uh, mechanism with respect to congestion charging and other things which I think is a much better, smarter solution. Will we be summoning the Russian ambassador up for the death of... Um, Sorry? Will we be summoning the Russian ambassador up for the death of... Um, you would have seen the tweets from both myself and the Foreign Minister yesterday. Um, you know, uh, Navalny was someone who actually advocated incredibly strongly for anti-corruption and, and democracy. Those are critical uh, things that he, and freedom that he stood up for very well and liberal democracies. We're very concerned about that. Um, we'll be continuing to talk, um, I, I imagine, with the Russian uh, ambassador um, and also our foreign minister will be making uh, remarks elsewhere where he needs to. The question was whether we'll be summoning, summoning the, the Russian ambassador. Again, uh, that's a conversation uh, that the foreign minister and I will have earlier in the week. Well, so you, the, the UK is doing that. Why aren't we... Well, you've seen us come out pretty strongly with our well, statements of yesterday. Um, else. Do you believe the Russian authorities are responsible for his death? Uh, personally, I do. Yes, I do. Well, look, again, you know, we've got uh, to make sure our immigration strategy uh, and policy needs to be dynamic because it needs to reflect the reality of our economy and where we sit and what opportunities we have and where their job vacancies are and where we need to power up the economy more. We need to make sure that any immigration policy is well synced up with our infrastructure planning as well. Uh, and so, you know, the Minister is now working through exactly where we are. We've gone from a rather perverse situation where, you know, we had everything turned off and then everything was opened up uh, and we need to be able to go through all of those changes and actually meet clear about what's working and what's not working. Where things aren't working, we need to stop it. Where things are working, we need to make sure that we've got the checks and balances in place. Just so um, I know she's working really hard on that at the moment and she'll continue to do that over the, over the next quarter. Just, just, just to clarify, on yes. a couple of viewers today you mentioned that they've actually supported the status of the treatment before we obviously think that they change your mind. Are you noticing the full party membership on that? No, uh, we've got a long-standing position in the National Party. Um, we are supporting the bill to first reading, as I've explained many, many times before, but our National Party position holds. Party the same to me, that they would want to see that 
Well, uh, I can tell you there's a range of views and a range of political parties up and down this country as there should be, and that's important. Uh, but what I'm saying is our national party position is, uh, is very clear. Just to, uh, Prime, yes, mate. Prime Minister, you mentioned kind of or at your speech and some of the figures that were, I, I guess I would describe as quite dire, but... Very dire. Yeah, we are deeply, deeply concerned, Chris Bishop and I, around uh, the debt that's emerging there. It's, I think it's $29 billion by 2033. That is unbelievably staggering. Uh, you've seen a proposal from from uh, Kainga Ora to sell off 10,200 houses to try and write their books. Uh, and what you've seen us move, and, and the Minister move incredibly quickly, I thought, within a matter of weeks of forming a government, uh, to actually form a very short, surgical, sharp uh, review team headed up by Sir Bill English to actually get to the bottom of procurement, asset management, um, spend, uh, governance uh, through the organisation. So, you know, it's fair to say we are deeply concerned about it. Uh, it's the same issues that we've seen from this previous government, though. You know, and I want New Zealand to understand. You know, they should never vote for the Labour Party for another generation. It's um, as simple as that, because the ungodly economic mess that we have been left with. How on earth do you not commit to funding Farmac uh, beyond at some point this year? You know, how does that work? And so how do you not commit to funding projects that you've gleefully announced and actually haven't backed up and actually got the funding in place? How on earth do you do something like this with Kaiangora? So we want to see more community housing providers having access to capital so they can get good building houses. Well, we know we've got challenges in the housing sector. It starts with home ownership. Um, if you can't own, you end up renting. If you can't rent, you end up on a social house wait list. If you can't get on there, you're on emergency housing. So we know those four issues are very linked up, uh, and the Minister and the team are working incredibly hard to make sure that we can get housing uh, to a much better place in New Zealand. Just to quickly clarify on this question about um, uh, Alexei Navalny, whether um, you said that Russian authorities are responsible. Do you mean Putin's responsible? Well, look, I mean, it's, it's, um, I can't be any stronger than I sort of said yesterday, which is that you know, we are gravely concerned about um, someone, an opposition leader, imprisoned uh, for standing up for values that we believe very strongly in liberal democracy. And so when you're, when you're advocating for freedom, for democracy, for freedom of expression, um, you know, values that we as all Kiwis, irrespective of your political party that you support, stand up and believe in, uh, it's incredibly concerning. And that's why you're seeing, I think, uh, a consistent reaction from the rest of the world to say, hey, listen, this is, um, this is unacceptable. If you, if you say you say Russian authorities are responsible, then by exception you must think that, that you Responsible. Yeah, again, I mean, I, I, you know, it's, 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 you know, that's my personal view. Uh, but the reality and is, the yeah, but my, my, my view is really clearly is that that is not something we want to see. And so we have to call up and stand up for values. And we talk a lot in New Zealand about our independent foreign policy and the values that are very important to us. And again, what you've seen under our new government is that we want to stand up for those values and want to back them up with actual actions and words and deeds. And whether it's been, whether it's been you know, in the Middle East, whether it's been in the Red Sea with Houthis, uh, you're seeing us actually standing up and putting um, putting action behind our words. David Cameron and Joe Biden are both warned Russia to expect consequences um, after the death of Navalny. Is New Zealand warning Russia of the same? To expect well, again, you know, we're in New Zealand at the other end of the world, but what we're doing is we're standing up with like-minded countries to say, hey, this is something that we cannot stand. Uh, and so you've seen us... consequences after its invasion of Ukraine. So sure, sure. And so, but again, you know, we're standing up for the values that we think are really important. And so, so we'll work our way through that in the... In, in the coming week uh, with the Foreign Minister and myself. Uh, we'll work our way through that in the next week. Last question. It just means, actually, I don't think there's been enough straight talk with the New Zealand people. The New Zealand people are smart enough to understand the reality of where we are today, and they understand it. You know, And I think we've got a big turnaround job, as I keep saying, to get orchestrated here in New Zealand. We've been going down the wrong pathway. What we're doing is not working. Uh, other countries are leaving us behind, and we need to get our show on the road. And for that to happen, I need to be able to talk pretty bluntly, pretty directly, pretty straight up with the New Zealand people to say, here we are on education. I'm sorry, but 55% of our kids not at school is not great. 80, you know, 50% of our kids showing up for beginning high school not knowing the basics well and being prepared and ready for high school means that they don't want to go to school in, in, in year 9, year 10, they drop out again. So you know, we've actually got to call out the fact that we need to move people off welfare. It's not a great success if we've got people on welfare. We want them in work. It's so much better for them and for everyone. So I'm just telling the New Zealand people, which I think they want to hear, some straight talk, some very clear, here's the reality and here's the hope, not just in a kumbaya sense, but because we've got the plan to get ourselves to a different and a much better place. 
Well, some people won't like hearing that, you know, me speaking directly about the fact. But, you know, yeah, we, have, we have a new school year up and running, as you well know. I've been talking about education with Erica Stanford, with our government now for the last year and a half. We've been deeply concerned about kids not going to school. We have other developed countries like the UK, as I said, that's almost 80% regular attendance. We're at 45%. And what we've got is a culture of excuses why we can't get our kids to school. Well, I'm sorry, we are going to get our kids to school because we are selling them short. How on earth do you show love, kindness and compassion if you're just happy to live with that? That's not success. That's not what we want to do. We want to build one of the leading small advanced countries on earth, period. And it starts with actually getting our kids having a world-class education system. So I think talking in these terms and being straight up about it and saying here's the problem and here's the solution. So yes, here's the problem. We are going to work very hard on, on, on attendance. I've asked David Seymour to lead that piece of work deliberately so that we can get some very much, much focus on that. Erica Stanford's already started to go through you know, the curriculum. She started to go through an hour. We've, we've implemented within a matter of weeks an hour of maths, reading and writing started this year. Immediately. We, now we push really hard to make it happen, but it's happening. And this year our kids have a better chance of learning some basics. We don't waste another year. We've got rid of the mobile phones. Uh, that's proving to be a great success from principals, kids and from parents across the country. So those are examples where I'm trying to be saying to New Zealanders, you know, I appreciate there's a whole bunch of noise and we can talk about a bunch of things back in the parliamentary gallery, but out there in New Zealand, honestly, they want us to rebuild the economy, lower the cost of them, they want us to restore law and order, they want us to deliver better health and education. And so that's what we're fixated on and we're seeing through the noise and we're focused on actually getting that job done. So, um, you know, that's why I'm saying that that's straight talk and that hasn't been how we've communicated with the New Zealand people before. I think they all want to know the reality of where we're starting off from and then they want to know the plan and the actions and to hold us accountable for improving the outcomes and the results. Okay, thanks team. Appreciate your time. Take care.